Thank you. Thanks for the welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Torin. And uh, I must tell you that that is a challenging name to sport in an English-speaking uh, country. And I am from Norway, or Norwegian. Uh, <laughs> And uh, my name is really old, it's from the Viking Ages. It's actually the female version of the God of Thunder, Thor. So I don't know, does that make me Lady Thor? I don't know. Either way, it's quite uh, the name to live up to, but I found that the best way for me to really own it is to appropriate my own culture by dressing up like a Viking. <laughs> Any chance I have. And this is um, me commuting to work on Halloween. So speaking of work, uh, I'm a product designer at Stitch Fix. Uh, and uh, me and uh, the team have spent the last year or so uh, redesigning our onboarding flow. And today I'm going to talk through uh, some of the challenges that we faced, some of the guiding principles around design, some user feedback that informed our product decisions. And I personally learned a lot from this process. So I'm hoping to pass on some of those learnings to you. Before we start, I know we've done a lot of show of hands, but uh, who here has heard of Stitch Fix? That's almost everybody, okay. I can probably do this pretty quickly then. So uh, Stitch Fix is a personal stylist. Uh, first, you sign up on our website or, or through our mobile app. And then your stylist will pick out five items and send them to your door. And you can buy what you like and then you send back the rest. And our technology is what helps the stylist select the best items for each client, which means that you, as the client, get a unique and varied and personalized experience each time. What I think is cool about it is the way that our clients feel when they unbox their first fix. If they receive an outfit that makes them feel confident to take on new challenges in life. And for me, wearing nice clothes that fit me well gives me the confidence to do things that are outside of my comfort zone but I do not like to go shopping. So for me, Stitch Fix is also about the convenience. And to make sure that you get a good fix, you have to go through an exhaustive style profile when you first sign up. We do ask you a lot of questions, and that's the part that I'm gonna talk about today. Because Stitch Fix is really unique when it comes to onboarding. Um, most companies increase conversion by minimizing friction, but we've actually seen quite the contrary. It's often when we've added more questions, we've gotten conversion wins. Because we build trust with our clients through the questions that we ask. This is an example of one of our landing pages, which is uh, often the, a new client's first impression of us. And uh, what we found is that people are more and more skipping over reading the manual uh, on their landing pages. And they're quite happy just to sign up uh, sign up for an account, take the style profile, and then, and then they assume that we're going to tell them how things work as they go along. Uh, so they click on the big take your style quiz button and then enter into the profile. And for the longest time, we've had a style profile that looks pretty much like this. We made some incremental changes to it over time, but essentially this was the state of the style profile when I was asked to lead our conversion efforts. So we decided to add some helpful information about how the service works along the way. For example, like this, and I don't know if you can see this, but um, essentially, after we've asked about your sizes, we would highlight that we also do free exchanges uh, on the off chance that the item, I, I, items that you receive won't fit. Uh, and we added six of these helpful little tidbits throughout the profile. And to me, this made a lot of sense. Uh, and I remember being just when we launched this as an A-B test, and I thought it would give us positive results. But I was wrong, terribly wrong. This actually led to a decrease in conversion rates. Uh, so we started digging into the data more closely to find out why. And we noticed that the biggest drop-off actually came on mobile devices. And the content here on mobile web and desktop web, are, it's, a, it's identical. The only difference between mobile and desktop is the, the added physical scroll that you have to go through. And we saw this frustration in our qualitative research as well. Uh, participants felt frustrated about halfway through the profile, uh, particularly on mobile. And I would like to share a clip with you from one of our studies. How often would you, oh my goodness, okay. I'm just gonna leave it all at sometimes because this is way too tedious, like way too tedious. Like I, um, I would have stopped by now. 
because this is just taking up way too much of my time. I mean, I haven't even gotten into the website yet. I've already given you like my firstborn child and I haven't gotten anything for this. So the style profile just simply feels too long and too cumbersome at this point. But clients also get why we ask so many questions and they do want to answer them because they wanna, they wanna receive a great first fix. And we want to ask, you, ask them the right questions as well so that we can send them a great fix. But it is totally understandable. Look at the style section. It is just super long. And this section is actually so long, I exceeded Keynote's uh, maximum positioning outside the viewport when I was pulling together this presentation. And it's also not ideal that the five sections, they're not spaced out evenly. So it gives the user a false uh, impression of progress. We also discovered a lot of other traps in the profile. For instance, we are repeating ourselves in some of our questions. As you saw, we overload our customers with information. We have a tendency to write lengthy copy. We have really cumbersome drop downs. We have some questions that are open uh, to interpretation. I don't know about you, but I don't know what Boho is. Maybe I should. We have a great opportunity to use uh, visuals instead of boring checkboxes. We have some really unnecessary steps that don't always apply to everybody. We throw errors before you've had the chance to interact. And knowing your sizes is really hard. So as you can see, there is plenty of stuff. I don't actually think, though, that each of these individual traps would necessarily make your customers leave. But the cumulative effect of all of this together is guaranteed to have a meaningful impact, I think, of how they perceive your product. Also, we've had a growing user base that access our site via their mobile device. And as you can see here, the style profile is responsive. It doesn't break, but it certainly isn't truly mobile first. So what we needed here was a big bang redesign. And you can't really do a mobile first redesign section by section. So we needed to take a holistic approach, but that can be expensive. And I think a lot of people looked at our style profile and say, oh yeah, that's mobile friendly. But the truth is they haven't gotten creative enough by the, uh, about that. And both me and my managers could see that we have great potential. So we, we really worked hard on building up that cross-functional alignment because we style and we buy and forecast based on the data that we're getting from this style profile. And any change, changes that we make to that can have downstream uh, implication. So the organization gets anxious about rocking that de delicate balance. So it's challenging to uh, make changes to it, but it's not impossible. So we, used, we took data from that experiment that I just told you about, and then we accompanied that with many of those clips of users who voiced their frustrations about the length, and that really helped us define a, a business case and uh, define the goal of improving conversion by making the experience mobile first, but not changing any of the underlying, underlying data, and design that in a way that unlocks opportunity for personalization. So, these are the design principles for the new profile. We are starting with propelling the user forward. We should not, be, we should not make the user do any more work than what, what's required. We want to be predictive and we want to be smart. If we can make a good guess, we should make it. And visuals will go a long way. I mean, we're a styling service. We're not the DMV. So from those principles, we defined our project goals. And uh, we wanted big touch targets because thumbs are bigger than mouse pointer, as you've seen. Uh, we want clearer affordances because thumbs often cover up the UI when you interact. We want to auto advance when you're done with a question because precision scrolling is super annoying. We want consistent button placements to minimize the physical work. We want simple gestures over dropdowns, iconography and illustration so that users can grok concepts without having to read every single word, shorter and clearer copy, and then last but not least, uh, show accurate progress so that they know how much is left. This is not rocket science, but mobile friendly, uh, mo mobile first rather, is different to mobile friendly. And I think mobile first UI is just what users have come to expect from the web. And if we don't deploy like this, it's broken. 
So we hosted a day-long workshop where we brainstormed solutions. Uh, we invited our cross-functional partners from engineering and from algorithms and product and creative to participate. We generated a conference room full of ideas that turned into low-fidelity wireframes that later turned into a clickable prototype. And we used that prototype to do user research. We ran probably about 25 different studies to learn what resonated with clients. And we were so excited about all of this progress, we started sharing out our unpolished solutions across the organization early. And designers have a tendency to kind of sit on their designs until they're polished. And I definitely used to be one of them. But my recommendation is, to myself and you, uh, to share early and often, because getting feedback from your partners early will ultimately make your work better. And uh, what I found was that uh, people really uh, appreciated being included early and to have the opportunity to give feedback. And we wanted to get the best thinking out of our partners. So it was really a win-win. Uh, I'm going to talk through an example of uh, one of our early product meetings. So this question is uh, from the style profile. We asked their clients uh, what they'd like to flaunt. Clients like this question, it's cool. Uh, however, we really wanted to streamline it because it's particularly lengthy and repetitive. So we would talk through the traps of this particular question and show a video of someone sighing uh, at, the quest at the question and, and the repetitiveness. And then we would talk through our uh, recommended solution. So for early stage sharing, uh, I think sketches are way better than polished UI. And if you show mocks that are very polished, even if they're just concepts, people have a tendency to get hung up on the details. Or even worse, they might hold their feedback because they worry it's too late. So, but even if this, uh, this sketch is super rough looking, people get what's going on. Because everyone in the company can recognize the, the red CTA in the bottom as our call to action. They can see a progress bar at the top. And they can understand that we're suggesting that the user should be able to make multiple selections about which body parts they'd like to flaunt and which they would rather downplay. And uh, so they would ha stay high level enough to give us great feedback. And this type of fidelity is really easy to get, uh, get to from, a, uh, from the iPad with the paper app. So the audience for these types of share outs would vary uh, from large to small, from engineering to product and creative, but the format was always the same and would always show a video of a client go through, going through the profile followed by a debate. And there's nothing as powerful as watching a client struggle with your interface. It's a great way to settle arguments, particularly over things that are truly subjective. And after hearing that client uh, earlier who complained about her firstborn child, uh, we got zero push pushback on the design changes that we wanted to make. In fact, we got encouragement instead. Another thing that we've done is uh, we've pulled together highlights reels and we invited teams to join us for a usability movie night. And this is a really fun way for others in the company to get closer to the work that we do and build, build empathy for our clients. So we've used this usability, uh, usability movie night format as a form of social event as well. And here, myself and my colleague Tyler are getting ready for happy hour at one of our engineering summits. And if you really want to level up participation, I can re recommend making bingo cards out of the usability issues in, in your videos. And then, of course, have some fabulous prizes for the winners. But the overall goal of this is really to socialize the work in the organization so that there's no need for a big reveal at the end because everyone was brought along. And at this point, everyone was bought into a mobile first approach. So let's dive deeper into some of the design solutions that the team landed on. Starting with the outfits question in the legacy profile, it's a scroll, it's a long scroll of 12 outfits. They're relatively small. They have tiny touch targets that requires thumb precision, and it's very cumbersome. And then this is the redesign. So we're replacing a long scroll by a page-by-page -page UI. And if we zoom into it, we see that the buttons are massive. They have plenty of visual affordance as you, talk, as you tap. The buttons are easy to reach, and they stay consistent in the same place as the user advances from one outfit to the next. 
And the two column full screen layout as well um, makes room for a bigger outfit, which is always kind of helpful when you're asking people to rate an outfit. It propels you forward, it's fun, and it's delightful. Here's an example of one of our many single select questions in the style profile. So in the redesign, we added some visual interests, which, which makes it more inspiring than just boring text. And um, all the single select questions then auto advance to the next page to remove the need to scroll to the next section. Drop downs are really the UI of last resort for mobile. And uh, we got this lady to help us make that case for it. What sizes do you typically wear in a dress? Mm -hmm. And then the shirt and blouse, same thing. And the bra, we got the, that one. I'm just gonna go ahead and say out loud that the Drop down boxes are a complete pain in the neck. I do not like them. So that resulted in a swipe UI for sizes. Uh, it's, oops, let's see. It's easier to reach, it's easier to make selections, it's easier to edit selection and also to move on to the next page. And uh, here is an example of how we can make some smarter guesses uh, when we can. So this is a little intricate, but basically, uh, if we know the height and weight, we can reposition the size scroller on the next page so that the most likely sizes are within the viewport. And I think like, questions about sizing can be sensitive and sometimes really difficult to answer because, because sizes generally vary so much between brands. So the least that we can do is to make it, uh, the UI simple to use. We also use visuals as much as possible. So for colors and patterns, then text labels and boring checkboxes have been replaced by swatches. We use iconography for clothing categories. It's uh, visually more attractive and it really uh, helps the users grok concepts without having to read everything on the page. They can more quickly get the overview and make their selections and then move on. And similarly, when uh, we ask how often you want clothes for different occasions, we, we're using illustrations here too, but we did think about uh, using photography instead of illustrations here. But the downside to photography is really that people have a tendency to get anchored on the specific item. And uh, illustrations and iconography is just more universal, universally relatable at this point. Uh, so as I mentioned, we built out all of these screens and many, many more into a robust prototype for qualitative testing. And I'm personally a front end coder, so I like to write static HTML pages for that, but it, I don't believe that it matters to your study results if the prototype is code or flat images. But what I have found very helpful is to have a prototype that has real data so that you can allow your user to go through the flow as if they were not testing. So take this question, for instance, about occasions. If we ask an artificial scenario like, pretend you want date night clothes often, we might learn if the labels and the buttons are easy to use. But if we, if we actually uh, let users answer as, as if they were not testing, we might learn that none of these options actually suit their needs, which would be a much more valuable um, takeaway. And in qualitative studies, uh, we always ask our participants, what was the worst thing about the style profile? And like I mentioned earlier, participants uh, had traditionally been, been uh, complaining about the length and their feedback didn't really go beyond that because the worst thing about the profile was genuinely the length. But now with this new UI, the profile doesn't feel as long. So instead of complaining about the length, they would unpack more interesting and nuanced answers to the question and we would wound up with a really valuable critique. So for instance, we discovered some problems here with the question about characterizing your proportion. I don't really know if my arms are long or short or average, and I don't know about you. But let's hear how a participant uh, reacted to this question. How would you characterize your proportions? My arms are short. Let's see. My shoulders are average. My torso is average. I wish some of the things would have changed, like if it's asking if you've got broad shoulders or average. I kind of wish that that would uh, 
change so you can kind of get an idea because I'm really not sure if I have broad shoulders. I love my shoulders, but I don't know if they're broad. I know that I'm very defined and they're pretty big for my size, but they're not like, oh, go, look at that girl with a massive shoulder. <laughs> so um, I would have liked the animation to change a little bit. So, I mean, I think that worse than not knowing the answer to this question is that the language comes across as pretty judgy. Like if you don't click average, you're somehow deviating from what's normal. And obviously we don't want to give our customers an unhealthy body image from our style profile. That's the worst. So showing this clips, uh, this particular clip to the team to generate, to generate some momentum and support for testing alternatives was a way more powerful than me complaining that I don't know if my arms are long or short. So to solve the problem, we flipped the question on its head. So instead of asking you to char characterize your body proportions, we're asking you now about fit challenges. Uh, so when trying on shirts, how did the sleeves usually fit? And it's much easier for clients to identify if shirts are too tight or too loose or too long or whatever versus knowing if their shoulders are broad or not. Users also started calling out flaws in our conditional logic, which is something that we hadn't seen so much before. And uh, I have another clip for you. And what is your preferred tone of jewelry? Mostly gold or mostly silver? Hmm, probably a healthy mix. Ears pierced? No. And is there anything you would never want to receive? And I'm assuming on this one, I can click multiple. Um, so let's see, I have too many scarves. No pierced ears. Not sure why it asked me if my ears were pierced earlier, if I'm also telling it no earrings here. And then there were some things that were a little odd, like it asked me if I had pierced ears, and I said no, and then earrings appeared on that question a little later on. And I said I wanted no jackets, but it asked me for my jacket budget after that. Um, so it was kind of weird how sometimes things seem to keep popping up over again that should have maybe died. So this, um, this learning made me think of something that I ran into when I filled out my visa application to move to the US to come work at Stitch Fix. <laughs> Have you ever ordered, incited, committed, assisted, or otherwise participated in genocide? I hadn't, so I clicked no. <laughs> so, I'm assuming this is a pretty important question, but at this point, I'm actually not sure if I have clicked yes or if I have clicked no. <laughs> Thankfully, there is a tooltip. <laughs> Anyways. Back to the style profile. <laughs> if, if we uh, make smart choices here in the decision tree, we can ask more detailed questions about the things that actually matters. So if you don't want jewelry, we can skip asking if your ears are pierced. We can also auto-avoid auto jewelry uh, at the categories level. And we don't need to know how much you'd like to spend on jewelry. And these, this page-by-page -page layout lends itself extremely well to conditionally hiding and adding questions as you go. We're essentially dialing up the feeling of personalization as the client goes through the flow, so that they get the sense that we're learning about them, that everything feels relevant, but that nothing feels forgotten, and they feel like it's personalized. So we've built the trust. The more we learn about a client, the smarter we can also be. We can speak to what's most important to you. Like for instance, if you indicate that you're pregnant or you have a new job and you're looking to level up your workwear so that when you arrive on the payment screen, we don't need to clutter it with marketing messages. We can let the payment screen do one thing only, making it easy to select your choice of payment and input those credit card details. At this point, we want the user to know exactly what they're paying for and what's gonna happen next. We want, them, we want them to trust that we can select items for them that they'd like and that they feel excited about their first fix. And it worked. I mean, we saw a significant lift in style profile completion from this project. 
and I was thrilled about the results, we had managed to redesign a legacy profile without changing that underlying data. And maybe surprising, we also saw a significant uptick in completion for desktop as well. So although this was designed mobile first, it's not like the experience was awful on desktop. Uh, it's simply a better experience no matter what medium you're in. So I ran this study where I asked participants to go through both versions of the style profile, uh, both the legacy and the redesign, and then compare them. And uh, one participant had a comparison here that I thought maybe this crowd would find interesting. Let's hear. What are the main differences between both versions of the style profile? I would liken them to the difference between DOS and Windows when it first appeared. <laughs> Windows is a GUI interface. It has some cute pictures that are easy to understand, that are easy to click on, easy to get where you're going. DOS was a complicated sentence for just about every task, or many for a task. It was more difficult. It was more for the advanced. I think the pictures are better because it doesn't leave anything open to interpretation. You can see the picture so you know what you're getting into. So now we have a mobile first and Windows-like style profile out in the world. It's time for me to wrap up this deep dive. So I think that as an industry, we have a tendency to think that shorter forms are always better for conversion, but it's not always true. You can get really solid conversion as long as it's in the right format as long as you use the answers that your clients give you to give them a better experience. So I recommend keeping these principles in mind, propel forward, predictive, and delightful. And it's, there's a fine balance to strike from a one size fits all experience to a highly personalized onboarding. And a lot of the personalization that you'll see from Stitch Fix comes through what you receive in your fix and the relationship that you build up with your stylist but it can definitely start at onboarding from when we, start, start, when we first start learning uh, what interests you. And these are my five takeaways from this project. And they are that mobile first designs will have to be a holistic rethink. We need to start by setting goals that are inherently mobile first. Test your designs early and it's totally okay if that's in like rough format, but do let your users experience a flow that mimics reality with real data so that they can pretend that they're uh, not testing. And then finally, socialize your results. If early stage, then, then sketches are great. And if you have videos of users, then that's super powerful. And uh, as you've probably noticed, we have developed a boatload of new styles and interaction models for this profile. And it's different to the rest of the experience. And this is creating inconsistency in our product. So, me and a couple of other folks are establishing now a design systems team, I know this has been mentioned a few times, uh, with the goal of being able to ship awesome experiments all the time, but keep the experience design uh, consistent and delightful and inclusive for everybody. And as a growing team, we need that robust system in place for the team to use. If not, the system will design itself. But that will have to be in the next episode, uh, if you'll have me back for the next conference. Thank you.